Okay, so I'm going to talk about no, the neutrino frontier. I apologize in advance because I'm the thing that is between you and Booz, but hopefully it will be uh, quick. Um, I also have a disclaimer here that this is not going to be like the previous two talks. I'm not going to go over all the topics of the neutrino frontier. It's too broad to do it in 14 minutes. Instead, what we decided to do was actually to, um, um, to coordinate the neutrino folks to try to cover as much neutrino theory as possible in this workshop. So whatever I don't talk about here, you can blame other people because they should have included in their talks, okay? There's a lot here which is my own personal view also. So I'll try to focus on things that I, I, I find interesting and things that are, are, have a big um, overlap with the neutrino, uh, the US neutrino physics program, okay? Especially liquid argon time projection chambers. So let me use one thing here to motivate what I'll talk about. We have anomalies in the neutrino sector. I don't want to go deep on this. I actually don't even want to discuss them, uh, but I want to use them to, uh, to, to motivate why we need to do uh, the, the future steps that I'm going to tell you, okay? So just to uh, situate you, these um, uh, anomalies are the LS and D anomaly and the mini anomaly. So these are um, excesses of uh, electron-like events on uh, experiments that should not have seen uh, electron-like events. Uh, and we have the reactor anomaly and the gallium anomaly. The reactor anomaly is a mismatch between the neutrino flux, the measured reactor neutrino flux, and the uh, calculated reactor neutrino flux. Uh, the gallium anomaly is a similar thing, is the discrepancy between the measured uh, neutrino capture rate uh, from one of these radioactive sources, uh, uh, the discrepancy between that and the theory calculation, okay? Um, these two anomalies here, they are, they are mostly, uh, I could say they are mostly data driven. Well, these two anomalies here, they are very much theory driven. And the theory calculations are very hard to, uh, behind these anomalies. Okay? So, I just want to say that these anomalies are not resolving. All right? We still don't know exactly where they come from. We still not, don't know what is responsible for these anomalies. There has been, uh, studies, especially the recent analysis from, uh, Microbone, where uh, we improve our understanding of minibone, but uh, in my opinion, it's not yet resolved. We can talk about that uh, later or, or during beer time. Um, honestly, uh, in my opinion, further data is needed, especially from the short baseline neutrino program with a near detector. Having a near detector is extremely important to control systematics and uncertainties, as I'll, uh, I'll talk to you about it uh, later, okay? But again, I don't want to discuss these anomalies. Uh, I, I actually want to use them as motivation, right? So, um, all right, so let's take Minibun as an example, no? There are two logical possibilities. The first one is that the anomaly is explained by unaccounted standard model effects. All right, so what am I talking about? Let me give you one example, right? Minibun cannot distinguish electrons from photons, okay? Uh, the way it works is that the, the detector sees sharing of light if a photon converts to any plus or minus pair within the detector, it, it sharing calls just like a, an electron. So photon emission can originate from complex processes like the one shown, uh, shown over there, like when you produce a, a delta uh, resonance or heavier uh, baryonic resonances, which decay to deltas. The nuclear medium changes these decays in a non-trivial way, but the point is that the theoretical calculations here are highly non-trivial. And they definitely need improvement, which can be seen as from this uh, plot here, where we have the um, photon background from delta production at minibun, and every single line is a different event generator, okay? So you can see here that there is a easily a 50% discrepancy between the lowest and the high, uh, between the, the nominal and the lowest line or highest line, which basically means that we need better theoretical calculations of certain processes, all right? Now, the next point is actually a bit more dear to my heart, and it might be more dear to your heart, is that maybe there is new physics there, all right? Again, don't get too hang up on the anomalies. I just want to use that to uh, motivate why we should look for new physics in neutron experiments and how we should look for new physics in neutron experiments, all right? So this is why we should look for new physics in the future of uh, the neutrino uh, experimental program of the U.S. This is a comparison, it's a two-scale event uh, 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 display of state-of-the-art neutrino experiment, NOVA, okay, and liquid argon time projection chambers. So you can see that this image is infinitely more uh, precise than this, okay? 
this experience here of the bubble chamber of the future, right? It's more than a bubble chamber because it also gives you calorimetry. So it gives you how much a particle ionizes as it travels the liquid argon. In the amount it ionizes has to do with its mass. We know its mass, we know what particle it is. Now you combine that, this very precise uh, picture of an event, event by event, with a gigantic statistical sample. For example, Dune will have 100 millions of events in the near detector, uh, and the SBND, the near detector of the SBN program, which is under construction, will have order 10 million events uh, uh, in its detector, all right? So it sounds like this is a very, very promising way to do new physics. And in fact, uh, not only because this is anomalies, but also partially because of these anomalies, there has been lots of proposals to look for new physics here. I don't want to go through all of those. I just want to go through one of those, okay? For example, some of these models, they actually connect like outstanding problems, outstanding questions of our standard model to observable phenomenology at neutron experiments. For example, imagine that you have, like this is one example, right? Don't get too hang up on this uh, as, as well, but imagine that you have a model where neutrino masses are zero because of a gauge symmetry. You break the gauge symmetry to give neutrino masses and the, the, the anomaly constellation uh, tells you that you have some extra fermionic content, which basically gives you a type three, uh, sorry, an inverse CSO style uh, uh, of neutrino mass mechanism. The nice thing about this kind of, of, of frameworks is that you give up the idea that neutrino masses are light because there is a gigantic mass scale suppressed in the Higgs valve. And you actually embrace the idea that maybe neutrino masses are light because they come not only from the Higgs valve, but from other new physics from a dark sector which is broken at a much lower scale, and that suppresses neutrino masses. Now, the point is, when you, when you buy that, uh, you get things like this, signatures like this, a neutrino come in your experiment, uh, it can upscatter via this new mediator to a, a heavy particle, like a, a heavy partner of the neutrino, and this guy can decay again to the new mediator, which ends up decaying to a plus and minus. Now, at Minibon, uh, Minibon, I told you that it can only see sharing of light, if the plus and minus pair is uh, collimated, the two Cherenkov rings will be very similar on top of each other. You don't know if it's one electron or two electrons, so you say it's an electron-like event, you get your uh, excess here, okay? Now, um, this is one of many of uh, classes of UV-complete models that uh, either predict that, for instance, the minimum excess is plus and minus, not electrons, or uh, photons, not electrons, okay? I mean, obviously, by construction, all these models, they need to look roughly the same at Minibon, but um, things are very, very different at uh, large PCs. Now, how am I doing on time? Good. All right. Good. So let me give you a few examples of these models and a few examples of the signatures at, at large PCs. So I, I take three examples here. The one is, is the one that I told you where, where this, this, this um, mediator is very light. Here in the liquid argon time projection chamber, uh, if this mediator is very light, this scattering might be coherent. And if the scattering is, co is coherent, you can see it, you only see plus and minus uh, 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 leading to basically two electromagnetic showers. So uh, two electromagnetic showers, nothing else, okay? Now, if this guy is heavier, actually you might start kicking things out of argon and you could have like some hadronic activity here. Uh, this guy here is not necessarily light, it could be heavier. Uh, sorry, it's not, it's not necessarily heavy, it could be lighter, it could be long-lived. So this guy here could actually propagate a bit and then decay again to plus and minus pairs. Minibone can see these protons because uh, most of these protons will be below Cherenkov threshold, but liquid argon time projection chambers can, okay? And finally, if you have like a transition magnetic moment, you could actually uh, have some hadronic activity and gap in an electromagnetic shower, but the, the photon has a typical gap in uh, uh, liquid argon time projection chambers. Here, this uh, generic new physics gap can be whatever the model allows you, okay? So the point is, every single model there will have a different experimental signature, which was not accessible before because of the details of how you reconstruct these events in your old detectors. Uh, but on the flip side, because the experimental uh, signatures are different, the backgrounds are also different. For example, if I take this guy, uh, I keep thinking that this thing clicks. If I take this guy um, here, okay, 
An obvious uh, background to this could be coherent gamma production. So uh, if they plus the, the two electromagnetic showers are kind of on top of each other, you have a coherent gamma production where you have only one electromagnetic shower, they might actually look like the two E plus and minus. But this is not a background to this guy. To this guy, you might have other things like pi naught production and so on and so forth. Now, the main problem is the following, that um, we need individual uncertainties on every single of these processes. Uh, I put a question mark here, but I know the answer, we don't have them, right? We just don't. Um, so without these uncertainties, we are in a very bad situation that we have beautiful detectors with very, very intense sources in very large masses, but we can't do the physics we want. So without a proper background uncertainty estimate, uh, we need to rely on, rely on tunings and uh, uh, sidebands. Now, what's the problem of tunings and sidebands? Well, in neutrino physics, this is a little bit different from LHC physics. When we tune, we tune a model of neutrino nucleus cross-section that we don't really understand that well. So the tuning parameters many times are unphysical, are not motivated, and maybe they are 250 parameters at a time and you just lose you know, any physics intuition you had there, okay? The sidebands, it's a little bit better, but again, differently from some of the things that we see in collider physics, for instance, if you're looking for, say, a bump search, you have your, your say, I don't know, QCD background from one side, QCD, QCD, QCD background from the other side, and then in some sense, you're interpolating the background. Here, most of the time, we're extrapolating. We have um, uh, sidebands for, say, high momentum or high multiplicity, but what we really want is the low, uh, is, the, is the other region, and we don't have the, the other side to interpolate. And as you know, if you ever did uh, extrapolation in uh, Mathematica, you know you cannot rely on that. So um, there are other things that we could learn with uh, understanding neutrino nucleus cross sections. Uh, the information is there, but we cannot leverage it right now. We need theory to leverage it. For example, let me give you just two examples here. One of them is uh, the fact that the event topology in neutrino events, they carry non-trivial information. And for example, this is a, um, a plot from the Argonaut, uh, uh, the Argonaut experiment at Fermilab, where they, 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 they had a, a, a neutrino beam mode and an anti-neutrino beam mode, and this is the proton multiplicity. And you can clearly see that in neutrino, in neutrino mode, you have a larger proton multiplicity than in anti-neutrino mode. And you can trace it back to the, to the hard scattering, right? That, of course, you need to dress this up with the nuclear physics and all that. But you see that there is something that, that remains from the hard scattering. The colored bars are the generator errors. Well, the generator estimates. And you see here that you get it wrong by like 50%. I mean, this high multiplicities, uh, I, I don't even know how, how wrong that is. Uh, oh, that's fine. Uh, is that, does that include questions? Oh, I'm meeting my question time. Okay, fine. Uh, but everybody wants booze. So, all right. So um, this is one thing. The other example is that uh, the hadronic activity can actually have a great impact on backgrounds, like a gigantic impact on backgrounds. And this is an example from the mini boon delta analysis. So they look at, into the it, mini boon, the mini, sorry. Microbone, the microbone collaboration, which has a very similar name to Minibone, the microbone collaboration, look at into the, the, the question if the delta background is what explains the Minibone excess. And the way they do that is that they look at that two different event samples, events, events with one photon and one proton, and events with one photon and no protons. With one proton, you can actually combine these guys and try to reconstruct the delta invariant mass. It's not great, but it's actually good for what you're doing. This reconstruction of the invariant mass cuts backgrounds, with, with, like the, the relative uh, uh, cut here in the background is like a factor of seven, okay? Between whenever you cannot reconstruct the invariant mass. So if you, if you know how many protons you expect, you actually can focus on the, 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 the samples which have little background. The problem is that generators don't really give you this rate as you can see here. And now, again, we need to rely on tunings and sidebands to do that. And they relied on tunings and sidebands to do that. So if we had theory 
we could actually leverage, if we had a better theory, we could leverage this information. So in general, uh, there is a large, very, very large range of standard and beyond standard model uh, searches and, 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 and signatures that, that have, have been proposed. And actually some of them are very, like maybe a third of them are very, very recent. So there has been an, an explosion of, of model building, but to, to allow us to assess this model building, we need to understand the physics of the neutrino nucleus interactions, okay? For example, let me just give you a couple of examples. There are the usual leptonic CP violation, neutrino mass ordering, fine. There is uh, uh, things like ultra large dark matter where no, the, the neutrino mass uh, uh, matrix can become time dependent, uh, inducing like, or time modulation on neutrino signals or uh, distortions on uh, neutrino oscillations. You can look for light dark matter in neutrino experiments. These are very intense and very large detectors. Uh, you can actually do something that you hear more on Zara's talk tomorrow, uh, model independent, independence math studies where you can actually relate your neutrino results to other experiments like LHC, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But to get there, we need theory. So I think I'll finish with some thoughts and, and I, I'm sorry I won't really conclude anything. Uh, because this is very much work in progress. There has been a lot of development on neutrino theory in the last couple of years, and, and things are evolving as we speak. Um, but just think that, that Dune will have an unprecedented uh, high energy intensity beam, okay? Combined with a very large fine grained detector and a near detector, which is multi-purpose, where not only you have a liquid argon time projection chamber, but you also have a gas argon, magnetized gas argon time projection chamber. These detectors, they can move uh, in, the, in, the, in the direction perpendicular to the beam axis, which allows them to actually see different fluxes uh, of either neutrinos or if you want to do BSM, dark matter or axions or whatnot. Uh, and just by thinking about this, at least to me, it seems that these guys have an enormous potential to discover new physics and for precision neutrino physics. But to unleash this experimental neutrino program, we need theory, we need more theory. Uh, we need theory on the neutrino nucleus interactions uh, aside. Uh, for instance, uh, what I think we need uh, personally is a combined community effort. I don't think any, any smaller community can solve that. Is a combined community effort where we have uh, lattice calculations, we have uh, nuclear physics, we validate with electron data. Perhaps we can use uh, machine learning techniques as we, we heard from Jesse uh, earlier today and so on and so forth. And from the other community we have model building and phenomenology, there is a lot of, of novel signatures and searches that have been proposed, connections to the outstanding questions of, of the sun model, like what is the origin of dark matter, um, and, and clever new ways to use the data. And perhaps we could even borrow or adapt techniques from other areas like LHC, because now we have these beautiful detectors and we need to understand what to do with them in a way that is less theory dependent, maybe. Um, so last, the last thing I want to say is that while, while in my opinion, on a, a combined uh, theory effort, is very important here, is key for this program. We also need to work very, very closely to the experimentalists because of the nature of these um, uh, detectors. So I think I'll finish here. Thank you. Thanks, Pedro. We're finishing on time. <laughs> uh, we have time for a couple questions, yeah. This is Yoni Khan. Thanks, Pedro. So, um, just because there there sort of isn't an analogous talk on on sort of the connection between theory and dark matter, I just wanted to make one comment about the analogy between what you laid out here really nicely and kind of how things work for for dark matter experiment. I think it's very similar. It's just you know the the need for nuclear theory to understand neutrino experiments is very similar. I think to the need for condensed matter theory to understand low threshold dark matter experiments, and these things intersect really importantly with sevens. You know in it has yes. better targets like germanium or something. And so I think the idea of a, a combined community theory effort where theory doesn't mean just high energy theory, but high energy to nuclear, to condensed matter, and just sort of a full court press to really understand what's going on in these very complicated detectors um, is, 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 is a way to go for all the reasons that you said. Yeah, I fully agree. I fully agree. I think neutrinos cannot solve the neutrino theory alone, <laughs> right? The same way that dark matters cannot solve dark matter theory alone. I, I fully agree.